Hey, welcome back to Critical Thinking. Last time we took a look at probability. In particular, we focused on a priori probability, but by the end we had moved on and introduced a posteriori probability, where judgments about probability have to be made after observation and the gathering of data. So we're talking empirical probability. And as you know, empiricism is the basis of science. So today, we're going to actually take a look at the basics of science. And we're going to spend most of our time focusing on the inductive scientific method. So let's get started. So what is science? Let's define it. The word comes from the Latin for knowledge, scientia. And since the classical usage of the term, which includes philosophy and theology, goes well beyond what we've come to understand as science today, let's restrict our description to one that would apply to the hard sciences and to some of the social sciences. Science is a search for natural causes and an instrument for producing effects in and making predictions about the natural world. It's a systematic pursuit of an organized body of knowledge based upon reasoning from empirical observation and quantifiable data to testable explanations for that data. And I'm not going to make a judgment at this point about whether or not such a goal is attainable. Scientists discover, observe, analyze, and compile facts through various methods in a rigorous and orderly way to draw out data relationships, then connect those relationships through explanatory devices such as hypotheses. Modern science has been incredibly successful, and as a result, we tend to believe it's the best and the natural method for obtaining knowledge. However, it's essential to recognize and evaluate its underlying assumptions to ensure that what we're learning is credible, accurate, and reliable. Science may be the primary way Western culture perceives and interprets reality, but we need to keep in mind that it's a system created by humans and it's based on a particular set of assumptions. And these include empiricism, objectivity, materialism, predictability, and unity. To elaborate, empiricism is the assumption that sense experience is the source of knowledge and truth. Objectivity, that we can study the physical world around us without bias. Materialism, that everything in the universe is constituted of physical parts. Predictability, that the universe is composed of interconnected and regular causal relationships. And unity, that the universe has an underlying unified dynamic structure. Since one way of looking at science is as a search for causes, let's distinguish causal arguments from causal explanations, and we can take up the principle of causation itself on another occasion. Causal arguments deal with causal claims. They're attempts to provide support for an assertion or conclusion that one thing caused another thing to happen. They're persuasive. Like all arguments, they're meant to show that something is true. And just as with analogies, the key to analyzing causal arguments is to clearly define the two things and their relationship. Causal explanations, on the other hand, attempt to elucidate how one thing caused another. They're not arguments. Arguments are used to support or demonstrate propositions, claims, while explanations reveal the how or the why. Propositions can be used for explanation, but in an argument they take the form of premises and conclusions. A causal explanation can be considered adequate or satisfactory only relative to what we're looking for. For example, let's say there's water around the bathroom toilet. That it's leaking would be an adequate explanation for calling a plumber. That there's a bad wax ring is better if you want to fix it yourself. And if you want to prevent it from happening in the future, you want to know how it went bad in the first place. But even though the concept is relative, we can still establish some minimal conditions for adequacy. The explanation cannot be self-contradictory, remember our first principle of logic, vague or ambiguous, what you should recognize by now is an endless source of trouble, or incompatible with established facts, and it cannot lead to false predictions. Which brings us to testability. Natural, at least physical, causal explanations generate expectations and predictions. If a leaking toilet explains the water on the floor, you expect the water to be cold, and you expect the floor to remain dry if you fix the leak. We test an explanation by seeing if the predictions generated obtain or turn out to be true. If you fix the leak in the toilet and another puddle appears, your first explanation probably wasn't correct, or you bungled the repair job. This is an example of what we call falsification. And note how we're still talking probability when it comes to conclusions drawn from testing. 
Of course, sometimes an explanation generates meaningless predictions or even no predictions. We call these explanations non-testable. For example, people listen to that song because it gives off good vibes. We would expect to predict that the more we played it, the more vibes would be given off. Unfortunately, we don't have any apparatus to measure vibes. There's no vibeometer or even identify exactly what those are. Again, vagueness and ambiguity. So there's no way to test the prediction because the prediction is actually meaningless. Or someone might want to explain Uncle Vinny's heart condition as a result of his crimes in a past life. We would expect to find more heart problems among past life sinners, and we would expect to find more past life sinners among people with heart problems. But our problem, how do we identify members of that group? Who counts as a past life sinner? Some might say we all do if we're stuck in the wheel of samsara. The point is, neither generate testable predictions. Transmigration, past life theory, we can't tell if it's true. Good vibes, we don't know what being true would even look like. Another thing to note, some predictions are difficult or impossible to test, not due to meaninglessness or any inherent flaw, but due to practical technical limitations as the history of science has shown. And what might be untestable now may be testable moments from now. And then we have circular explanations, which is one that simply restates itself. For example, why do talk show hosts with English accents sound like they know what they're talking about? Well, because English accents make them sound more intelligent. Why is the floor wet? Because there's water on it. Now, these responses are just repeating the very thing they're supposed to be explaining. They don't generate meaningful predictions, and they don't tell us anything new. And we also have unnecessary complexity. It's considered undesirable, something we want to avoid in a causal explanation. You may have heard of Occam's razor, named after the 14th century Franciscan philosopher William of Occam. It's a principle of parsimony which advises us not to multiply entities without necessity, or more simply, if two causal explanations do an equally good job of explaining something, the least complicated explanation is preferable. So with our bathroom floor example, an explanation that said the floor is wet because the toilet leaked and there's a hole in the roof would be overkill. Unnecessarily complex explanations contain elements in which we have no reason to believe and assumptions that are superfluous. So we've noted that both causal arguments and explanations deal with causal claims. Assertions about the cause-effect relationship, statements affirming that one thing causes another. But before we're justified in making an assertion scientifically, we have to start with a guess. An initial speculation about a cause, a conjecture, something offered as a possible solution to a problem, a testable hypothesis that can guide our quest. And in our search for causes, we can also divide the scientific endeavor into two basic categories relative to the events that we're trying to explain or investigate. Empirical, which deals with events of the present, and historical, which deals with events of the past, those not presently occurring. But since empiricism is fundamental to all science, whether we're investigating past or present events, it might be better to call scientific approaches to the present experimental science and scientific approaches to the past historical science both of which measure their views against the regular pattern of events observed in nature. The key to any scientific approach is always observation. Science is dependent upon empirical evidence or what's accessible through the senses. So when we talk about scientific method, and in reality it's better to say methods plural since there's no one universal method, it starts with the empirical method of gathering observable and measurable evidence and then proceeds with the formulation and testing of hypotheses to reach a best explanation. The inductive empirical method tries to determine the probability of a conclusion experimentally. This is that a posteriori probability we introduced in our last video. It requires the collection of data, so the probabilities can't be predicted beforehand, but only after experience. Rather than producing mathematical odds, this method generates a hypothesis that can be either confirmed or not confirmed by the evidence. We can break the inductive empirical method into eight general steps. Number one, the situation. Something has to spark scientific investigation. You have to recognize a situation that is generating a problem or a question. And the problem can be theoretical or practical. For example, you can talk about the redshift, or you can investigate the spread of cancer. Step two, we formulate the problem. We want to be precise about what it is we're studying. 
we want to ask some guiding questions like, what is it about the situation that's going to be researched? Exactly what questions do we want to answer? How are we going to look for the answer? What kind of study are we going to perform? Is it statistical, experimental, historical? There are any number of questions we can pose to guide the investigation. Step three, observation. Research begins when we watch and record the relevant phenomena, and that requires keeping track of all the data. Problem at this point is you can't tell what may or may not be important. So the more things you pay attention to, the better. In fact, we have a major philosophical problem here in the inductivist idea that observation and data drive science, specifically the realization that theory and assumption determine what often counts as observable and as data, something I'll dig into a bit more when we explore philosophy of science. Step four, reflection. We need to think about the new data we've gathered. What's developing? What patterns are emerging? Is there an identifiable causal mechanism? And while asking these questions, we want to reflect as well on previous information, what we call our background knowledge. What has other research shown? What's known of similar problems? Or what helpful principles might apply to this particular situation? Now, I just referred to causal mechanisms, so I probably should define this. A causal mechanism is an interface between a cause and an effect, an apparatus that has the property of making an effect happen. Where there is no causal mechanism between X and Y, they're coincidental. They're not causally related. Now, I personally don't really like this manner of speaking because it implies that there's some third thing between a cause and effect, which is kind of suspect, but it does help keep the question of relevant properties front and center. For example, given two unusual factors followed by a new event, such as a ruptured gas line and a leaky faucet, followed by the house exploding. The plumbing problem might be ruled out as a cause due to the fact that it's difficult to identify a causal mechanism. What property in the faucet would be relevant to our explosive event? The best diagnosis method asks a series of questions to gather information and derive a hypothesis based on which factors seem most relevant and potentially related to the effect in question. And this is where background knowledge comes into play. It helps make the determination. Like when dealing with a crime scene, evidence is gathered, suspects are questioned, the investigators then try to see which suspect's story and motives best fit with the physical evidence and with what we understand about human behavior. Step five, we formulate a hypothesis. This is the central feature of the scientific method. We make an intelligent guess, a conjecture about what's going on or the way things work. The hypothesis is a statement of what we expect to find. And there's an aspect of this that is neither inductive nor deductive, but abductive, a leap or a jump or a speculation that goes beyond the presently available evidence. In hypothesizing, we suggest the causal explanation for further investigation and study. This is not the explanation, but a guess toward a likely explanation. And again, we'll use the inference to the best explanation strategy for arriving at the most likely hypothesis. If the car won't start, and we have several guesses about what may be the cause, say a dead battery, a bad starter, it's out of gas, etc. We try to figure out which hypothesis is the most likely scenario, perhaps the dead battery. At this point, we have a focus for investigation. Step six, we make predictions. If the hypothesis is correct, then certain things are expected to follow. What's being studied should behave in a certain way under certain conditions. If we've discovered a truth, we should be able to make true predictions accordingly. For example, if the hypothesis is that fire can't burn without oxygen, then we can predict that the removal of oxygen will extinguish the fire, and this we can test. Step seven, we run the experiments. We repeat them doing further observation. If the predicted event occurs, we have a possible confirmation of the hypothesis. What we don't have is proof that the hypothesis is correct but we do have enough to continue along these lines and not jettison the hypothesis in favor of an alternative. However, if predicted events don't occur, the hypothesis is not confirmed and is likely false. So our final step is to accept or reject the hypothesis. Based on steps one through seven, we either believe the hypothesis is on the right track or that it's false. A good conclusion states how consistently the experimental results were, providing a degree of certainty. If the hypothesis was successful 90% of the time, we probably should stick with it. 
If the hypothesis is successful 60% of the time, further study is required to find out why. If the hypothesis is successful less than 40% of the time, it might indicate that the hypothesis needs to be abandoned. If the hypothesis is confirmed with a high degree of probability, it becomes a theory. And theories function as working knowledge for approaching further problems. A universally confirmed theory becomes a scientific law. Now, one final note, and this is going to set us up for a number of future conversations, the least of which is going to involve some propositional logic, because there is a logical structure to hypothesis testing. And understanding this is the key to understanding step seven and eight. If the hypothesis is correct, then we expect X is going to result. We see that X results, and we conclude the hypothesis is correct, right? Well, not exactly. We just said it's possibly correct. And it's been argued that there is a big difference between verifying a hypothesis and falsifying a hypothesis, that one's impossible and the other is actually our goal. Philosopher of science Karl Popper believed falsifiability is what distinguishes science from pseudoscience. Hypotheses are falsifiable, never verifiable. If we believe our experimental results have verified a hypothesis, we're committing a logical fallacy, that of asserting the consequent. So be careful, be cautious not to jump to conclusions prematurely or with overconfidence. And by the way, this fallacy is related to a bigger issue called the problem of induction. And I know I keep dangling the carrot here, but I promise we will look at this, just not yet. I think that's a good place to stop for today. We've got a number of things on the table that we're going to need to come back around to. But for now, what I've done is I've sketched a very rough outline of the scientific method. Next time, we're going to get a little bit more specific. We're going to focus on experimental methods that were developed by the English ethicist and philosopher John Stuart Mill. We're going to be dealing with the Mills methods. Until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.